Welcome everyone. We are the MI guys coming at you for the communication solution that will hopefully change your world here. We have Casey Jackson, Tammy Calais, Hello. and myself, <laughs> Chad Gilbert from the Institute for Individual and Organizational Change. And we are here to help you serve the individuals, the organizations, and the communities that you work for or work within and help transform lives out there in the real world. And we do that through talking about communication and talking about a lens of motivational interviewing and sometimes other evidence-based practices. If you're just joining us for the first time, this is our longer form podcast. We got a short form podcast and we got MI Minutes and we got all sorts of resources that we give you know, for free, just tons and tons of those. So for today, with a longer podcast that we have, it's a very hot topic. Casey, you've gotten a lot of requests for these kinds of trainings. Your background yes. in training is much more specific to this. And maybe we could talk a little bit about that today with your work with, you know, childhood and adolescence in the prisons and some of that very traumatic upbringing work and to give some credibility of where you're coming from with this, but also just to talk about the topic more generally. And if we touch on any points that resonate for you out there, please send in questions, clarifications, challenges to Casey, C-A-S-E-Y at ifioc.com, and we will do our best to address them and talk through them. So first of all, Tammy, if you wouldn't mind kind of introducing what the topic is, and then we'll kind of dive into it from there. Well, the topic is something that I don't know a whole lot about, so I look forward to learning and listening and asking as we go, but trauma-informed practice and as it relates to motivational interviewing. So I know that's some sort of evidence-based practice, I think, right? Because <laughs> motivational interviewing is an evidence-based well, practice, so I'm assuming they're one of the same, but... Well, it's interesting too. I mean, just even on that note there, it's it's the same thing with motivational interviewing. We talk about, you know, evolving practices, promising practices, evidence-based practices. It's the same thing with trauma-informed. There's so many words you can put after trauma-informed. Trauma-informed approaches, trauma-informed practices, trauma-informed care, trauma-informed organizations. So there's just trauma-informed is the critical construct. And where it comes from, Tammy, I'll give you a little bit about it and then how I, how I fell into, you know, improving my approach around it is the reality of the majority of individuals we work with, whether it's in healthcare, behavioral health, in schools, have experienced more trauma than we think so much so. And this is what anybody that knows trauma informed has any training in it at all has heard about the ACEs study. So I'll just tell you about that really quickly. And this gives you a really good construct of, of understanding how profound trauma and the impact of trauma is on our on our culture on our mainstream communities and so the aces, ACEs study was out of aces is adverse childhood experiences and it was done they interviewed people 17,000 Kaiser Permanente members so 17,000 so the sample size was a an amazing sample size and and I'll, I'll kind of suspend the thought about it being it being Kaiser Permanente members. We'll talk about that secondary, but primarily what it was is they just developed a questionnaire about childhood experiences, and most of the questions started with prior to your 18th mm. birthday, and so it was just people would respond to these questions, and it was like prior to your 18th birthday, did you lose someone close to you, a primary caregiver that was close to you, through death, divorce, uh, abandonment, or by, mm. by some other reason. Prior to your 18th birthday, did you ever see your mother slapped or hit or pushed or shoved or hit with something hard like a mm -hmm. fist or a brush? Before your 18th birthday, you know, did you ever have somebody demean you or belittle you or call you names or make you feel bad about yourself? So it's just literally, it was just all these questions. And and what you would expect, like just even common sense, you your background is not in mental health or addiction or even healthcare, tell me. But, but you're, if I said, if people have more of those experiences, what do you think? what do you think they might experience as they get older? And just, and, and just common sense would say, well, they'll probably have more depression or they probably are going to, you know, maybe they'll use a few more drugs, anxiety, things that would just yeah. make common sense. Right. Which is what they found, but what they also found through this, when they did the study of these adults, you know, they had the adults answer these questions. The first thing that stood out and it, and it wasn't shocking, but it did stand out. Is it about 23% had experienced some of those things. Mm 
you know, it, 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 within certain categories, like they completed that category as have it has experienced some level of trauma and or no, 63 percent. Yeah. And then yeah. over 60 percent had experienced it. And then 23 percent had experienced multiple mm. categories. So so the majority of people have had some adverse childhood experiences. But what they also found is the incredibly high correlation, not only with things you'd think about, like higher rates of like STDs, depression, anxiety, um, obesity, heart disease, liver disease, like things you would just think, wait a second, I can see the mental health side of it, but profound healthcare issues. And so much so that what they, so many people are really pushing heavy on is that childhood trauma is the number one burden on our healthcare system oh. in adulthood. That, that the adverse childhood experiences that people have cause an, an incredible impact on public. And so that that's why when the study came out, the thing that hit me immediately when I was reading through the ACEs study is I couldn't escape the fact that it was 17,000 Kaiser Permanente members is who they, who they did the study on. So the first thing I think about, well, what about yeah, people who don't have insurance? Exactly. Like that's 17,000 Kaiser Permanente members. So when I looked at the research, what it was is over 70% were Caucasian and over 70% had college education. So you look at how pervasive that is in that population, then you start looking at diverse and underserved populations. And you think, not that that means that there'd be higher rates, but it wouldn't be surprising to think that there's probably even higher rates of penetration of trauma and complex trauma in our in our culture, in our communities. And so where I was introduced to it, like John was talking about, you know, I, my career wise, I was raised in, you know, child welfare in treatment, foster care in foster adopt placements, then worked in prison systems, worked in adolescent substance use treatment. So of course, you're going to just see a profound amount of trauma. So of course that influenced it, but trauma informed was not really, that was not part of my training in the, in the late eighties. That's just not, that just wasn't a prevalent push to think about that. We knew it, but it wasn't conceptualized as, as concisely as it is now. Where ironically, where it came to me was not because of training, it was because of a person. Dr. Susan Butterworth, or not Dr. Susan Butterworth, Susan Dreyfus, excuse me. She was the secretary the, of Washington State's Department of Social and Health Services. So she had she had approximately 13, 14, 15,000 employees wow. underneath her as the secretary for Washington State of Department of Social and Health Services. And our paths just happened to cross very randomly. I had to do a presentation on motivational and what I'd done within her division, one of the divisions within Department of Social Health Services. They have all these divisions. One of the divisions was Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. We, I, the work that I'd done in Motivation Wing produced these really amazing outcomes. There was this whole kind of presentation to her about all this stuff happening in her divisions. And I did my presentation and she ended up pulling me to the side. Like she stopped the presentations after I was done, kind of stopped the agenda. And she pulled me, literally pulled me out into the hall and said, oh, wow. I need to know more about this. And so she and I had an opportunity, just a, an extremely brilliant individual, extremely brilliant individual. And she and I got to know each other professionally even further and, and developed respect. And I did more work within DSHS. But when she moved on, she kept pushing me and saying, Casey, I think you need to explore motivation and executive functioning. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And I just keep thinking, she's a really smart person. I probably should do this, but I'm just so focused on motivation. I'm don't, no, no, not quite sure what she's talking about. I knew what executive functioning was. But literally every interaction, whether it was an email or by the phone, and she and I have stayed in touch over the years, she continued to push it. Casey, I think you're missing the boat. I think I know, I know there's some connection between motivational and executive functioning. And so I started looking more at executive functioning. And every time I did, trauma-informed care would come up and trauma-informed approaches. And so basically the net effect, Tammy, is that what happens is when people experience trauma, especially chronic, tra chronic complex trauma, which means if you have abusive parents or absent parents or just things you can break, you know, if there's addiction or chronic life, chronic disease issues within families, that's hard on child development, right? And what happens is when you learn to cope that way, you basically start to function more predominantly in fight, flight, or freeze mode. You stay more, there's the different parts of your brain that developed. And our first part of our brain to develop is that caveman reptile part of our brain, which is mm -hmm. survival mode. And when you're in chronically stressful situations, your brain tends to operate in shorter functioning in your survival mode 
literally for survival. And trauma-informed care started looking at what John talked about on another podcast where we're talking about environments of safety and looking at how do you create safety and security and trust and comfort and empowerment, which is a trauma-informed approach. And then what I looked at is, oh my gosh, that almost aligns directly with the motivational learning competency assessment we worked on for what you're trying to create with evoking, supporting self-efficacy, empathy, you know, guiding, all those kind of concepts. It's like, oh my gosh, there's a Venn diagram of an overlap between evidence-based motivational interviewing and trauma-informed care when you look at the institutes on trauma, what they've published. So I started looking at that. Then what just, when things, that when the tumblers started to fall into place with me as a clinician and as a trainer in motivational interviewing is when I would land these well-constructed, complex reflections that were very deep in empathy but also guiding, like we think about, you know, change talk and sustain talk and MI, I literally could see somebody's facial expressions change. So a double-sided reflection, Tammy, that I would use that would take somebody from their primal brain up into their executive functioning would say things like, you know, you're so overwhelmed and, and you don't know if this is ever going to change. You want life to be different. You want to find a way out of this, but you don't know yeah. if there's anything that's ever going to help. In MI, we just call that a yeah. double-sided reflection. When you're looking from a trauma-informed perspective, you're helping people bridge from a fight, flight, and freeze brain up into the, where their problem-solving and coping mm-hmm. skills are. And so then all of a sudden, my brain just lit up, and I'm like, I, I don't, I never trained it this way, motivational interviewing, but there is something here. So everything Susan Dreyfus had said, the tumblers just fell into place, and the bell started ringing. I'm like, okay, this is it. This, there's, how can I teach MI anymore and not yeah. look at the brain science? How and what I'm saying, how does that actually have an impact on how this person's brain is firing? And this also gave me a deeper sense of why empathy is so critical, but why most people who do an intro training love the, the, the door to be opened into going high empathy, but then how do we start to shift people out without fixing them? And our natural instinct is to fix people, which is counterproductive to people that have experienced trauma. So how do we do an empowerment model where we're building from within? And what I started to look at that was just fascinating is I could see by the way that I would communicate, I could actually see almost these these neurons firing or these synapses starting to connect inside their brain. And I thought this this method of communication, this evidence-based practice of motivational interviewing, this is actually doing reparative work to the trauma this person's experienced. So it just it's just when things, and I thought I need... I need to come up with a training on this. I I need to develop a curriculum and look at how we can use motivation as a method of communication to set up a trauma-informed approach and skill set to start to empower people and help do reparative work from the trauma they've That's experienced. So there's your 10-minute overview of how I've you know, how the door opened and why it's such a profound way to start thinking about motivational learning in, in one of the the biggest pushes for people to be aware of across our country, probably across the world, but definitely within our country in terms of trauma-informed approaches are just, that is, if you're not operating from a trauma-informed approach, you're missing. Well, you're and missing what's the interesting boat. about that, so anyone can have, can have experienced trauma. Anyone at any yes. given point in time in their life can probably pinpoint a time in their life where they were in fight, flight, or freeze mode. And what's interesting is that in those moments, I'm reflecting on some myself in this time period, you are so stuck, you don't know where to go. And you're, you're paralyzed with not as, I mean, some, for some people it might be fear, but just paralyzed with uncertainty as to what's up from down, you know, it's like you're drowning and you're just like, I don't. I have, I, I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> so it's. Tammy, and what's so important about what you're saying right there, this is where they differentiated two types of, well, there's three different types of trauma, but what they differentiated, because what you're talking about is they ca- talk about big T trauma, which yes. is the car accident or the loss of a family member or like, and in that moment, your brain goes, well, you just yeah. don't know what to do because you're literally going into your animal response, which yeah. is just survival mode. You're just not being logical and you know you're not being logical. And just because you know you're not being logical doesn't mean Mm -hmm. you're going to start being logical.
It's just all this, all these things are firing from a survival mechanism. So there's big T trauma. Then there's small T trauma, which just think when you think about the experience you had where you don't know which end is up, think about that. If that's what you were raised in every single day for 18 years, right? That's little T trauma. And that's what they talk about as complex, more complex trauma, because because what you're doing is your brain has been trained to be in survival mode all the time. And you believe you're partially the source of all the mm. chaos that exists. So, so if your problem solving looks at that constantly, then when people reach in to try to help you, you tend to bite the hand that feeds you because you just don't trust it because you're in a, a fight, mm. flight, or freeze mode. The, the other thing that's really profound to think about with this, and this is when you look systemically at how our systems are set up within our mainstream culture in, in such a Western medical model is it is painful, but it is the truth that our systems are set up to deal with people that have not experienced trauma. When the majority of people have experienced trauma, we expect people to come into a doctor's office, to come into a substance abuse treatment center, to come into a school, to come into you know a mental health agency, and we start to give them information and explain how our processes work, which is all based in executive fun functioning, which is all part of your cortex, your thinking brain. And the reality is, is most people are coming in in a state of anxiety, which means their brain is not functioning here. And that's where all of our services are delivered. So everything's like this to them. And so it's exactly it. For those that are it's listening, exactly I'm putting it. my hand over my head. Like it's going over. You're just not yes. even processing. Yeah. You're not even connecting because they're in a state of anxiety or depression or fear because they're going in for a service. And we literally are trying to talk to their cortex or their thinking brain when their brain is existing within the, within that primal fight, flight, or fear within the reptilian brain. That's literally where all the brain activity is. And we're trying to talk to the brain where there's not a much as much brain activity happening. So it's just like, it, it is it is so paradoxical to think we expect people to come in for services and not have any trauma when they're coming into services because yeah. they've experienced trauma. It's it's just, it's so backwards. So, it's so is bizarre. it a different way to communicate? So when people have trauma in their lives or they've experienced it, it doesn't mean that they're in the fight, flight, or freeze mode in that moment. But- is, is trauma-informed practice just a different way to communicate with people or is it a different understanding of empathy, what people have gone through? This is all MI. This is why MI motivational learning has been such a bridge into trauma-informed because trauma-informed means a trauma-informed practice means you're setting up a place okay. where it's a safe place. You're setting up an environment where you're trying to empower okay. the individual. You're setting up environments where they're included in the decision making or they're empowered in the decision making process. So that's the environment. That's a trauma informed approach that you're setting up, which now you can see why for you, your brain makes a direct link and goes, well, it sounds a lot like motivational interviewing. Well, no, motivational interviewing is the method of communication. It's how are you opening your mouth to embody a okay. trauma informed approach? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Does that make sense? Interesting. So. Yeah. So this is why for me, it's like this, like it was a missing piece in my own development, profession, my own professional development, because it's like, and, and I know people that go through trauma informed. It's like, well, of course we want to be trauma informed. So we need to set up these safe spaces. We need to do this. And I think, and one piece could be missing is, but how do you open your mouth and say it? I think of like working with DSHS, ironically, is they would have these huge pushes in these initiatives around setting up a culture of respect. And they'd have these posters about, we need to respect each other. We need to respect each other. We need to listen differently, but they don't train them the communication. Yeah. How do we do that? Like, I want to, I want to be respectful. Of course I want to be trauma informed. So, okay. So what am I not doing that creates a safe environment for people? What am I not doing? Cause I think that's how I operate. But then if we actually listen to the actual words coming out of someone's mouth, it may not be trauma informed. It may not be. It's still going to be probably fairly traditional because that's what we're raised in, in medical model is in to be into a fix it mode. So I can listen a little bit more, but then I want to jump in and fix it. I can see them struggling and I want to give them some resources. So they don't struggle anymore. That's just what we've been trained to do, which is yeah. not trauma informed. Yeah, that's how everyone Does that make sense? So. Right. 
Right. And so it's how do you set up an environment or, or what are the components of a trauma-informed practice or trauma-informed care, a trauma-informed approach? And motivational for me is like, oh my gosh, this is literally the words that can come out of my mouth that embody a trauma-informed approach. And- the, the mindset, the intention that I have going into a conversation that set up a trauma-informed approach. Yeah, there is that that critical difference of thinking about it or believing in it versus being about it or embodying it. And just like yes. any complex skill or practice, it takes yes. practice with feedback. And I know we've talked about that on other podcasts, but be it motivational interviewing and trauma in this case, it's practice with feedback really is where the rubber hits the road of how are you being trauma informed? And when you know, you're know you talking about that, Casey, what comes to mind to also address what you were asking, Tammy, is you're catalyzing in that person's brain a workout of their executive functioning through your empathy and saying things, especially unsaid, making those educated guesses that Terry Moyers likes to speak to. If people could just feel better about doing that, we'd we'd get better with our empathy. And why does empathy matter for executive functioning and all these, these systems? It's because low empathy is toxic. There's a wonderful article you can look up if you're interested called, Is Low Empathy Toxic? by Dr. Uh, Terry Moyers. And the downward spiral that tends to happen is just so unequal and unfair to different populations, be it different skin color populations of African Americans versus whites to different socioeconomic statuses. And there's just different ways that these systems tend to prize, for example, business to get more training in higher order thinking systems like motivational interviewing training as the systems that serve the people that are just need it the most tend to not get as much training funding or the funding that they use doesn't focus on the being. It's the thinking like you were talking about, Casey, the knowing about respect versus being about respect or knowing about trauma informed versus being about it. And that's where it's needed most. One, One thing that was interesting to learn when I was getting oriented to this was also just about the recidivism this creates in prison systems as well, going through adverse childhood experiences and trauma and the predictability of, I think it was like five or more or something of just an incredible high predictability yes. of going back through recidivism through the criminal justice system. And that just being such a unfortunate outcome of then how, when we have certain systems and how we're treating people, it tends to perpetuate itself. Meaning that if we don't address this at an earlier point in our society, then all these things that follow tend to perpetuate this person that has trauma not addressing the trauma enough or working through it, and then they get disenfranchised and disempowered as other people that don't have as much trauma or that it's not as impaired, they come out of it. So it's just on the whole, it's such an unfortunate inequality. So I think motivational interviewing on the big picture, and then we'll get into the specific picture, is just providing this equal opportunity for people to engage their executive functioning, no matter what that background they might've been through, you're catalyzing their brain to engage in that, to empower them, no matter their circumstances, to to transform, to be more of who they want to be. And I think that's the hope. That's the, the transformative nature of why this is so far across the world in so many different cultures. So I wanted to speak to that on a whole of just the promise and the hope for an MI world with, with trauma and where we're going of the separation of power and just being so critical there. I do have a question though, also Casey, for you in, in this being more of your areas, writing down some things. I got a, a few different ones here. But one being like, what would you say from what you've been exposed to or what you've learned is the difference between adversity and trauma as it relates to how you empower people? Because sometimes people need natural benefits and natural consequences to to change. And there is good research around like adversity, helping people transform and be all the more versus people that don't, you know, face adversity. So like on that side of it, I'm like, well, isn't there a place for challenge and growth? But then at the same time, there's everything I just talked about that's really hardcore that is really disempowering, but sometimes change is uncomfortable. So I'm just wondering how you think about adversity or discomfort versus trauma 
as it relates to how you would help someone with MI? Well, I, I think the thing that I think of is partly, and I love getting into the semantic side of it, of how are we looking at it, how are we, how are we dicing this up? And the first thing that I think of is it adversity versus trauma depends on the individual and their life experience. One person's adverse rate can be somebody else's trauma. And how is that individual, how are they neurochemically, how is their brain processing what that experience either singular experience or sustained experiences, what is their brain experiencing? And, and we can, we can, I I think from a measurement perspective, I can measure it just based on their responses. If they're going into fight, flight, or freeze mode and, and they're staying there, then that's a traumatic experience. Somebody may say, well, they just can't. And I think this is where we have go down a whole road about political differences and all those different types of things is, well, people just need to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Ironically, if you put somebody in a, if you take that same person who believes that and put them in their own traumatic experience, then they'll justify why they couldn't get out of it because they were experiencing trauma. So when we get self-centered, our trauma that makes us stuck, we have way more empathy for than someone else's trauma that we think is an adverse experience because we think we would deal with that situation differently. And the level of adversity where the data is strong that shows growth, you know, and evolution is I think of things like just because with the kids right now, we watch so many episodes of survivor, those are adverse situations, but those are people that are functioning. And then there's a certain point because of dehydration and starvation that all of a sudden it becomes traumatic and they can no longer function or fire the same way intellectually. So what's something that was adverse in the beginning man to be in traumatic part way through after a certain amount of how much chronic exposure and how much they are pushed into literally survival mode. Is it an adverse experience or is it a traumatic experience? And I think those are the things that depending on where the source of your development is from, if you've developed good coping skills, I think more of those situations are experienced as adverse situations. It was hard. It was difficult. I joined the military. And it was one of the hardest experiences of my life. And, you know, but then I overcame and this is what I did. Well, that's probably somebody that has their executive functioning, their that CEO in their brain is pretty well intact versus somebody else that goes in the military and they break down in their AWOL because they just, they mentally and emotionally can't handle the, what feels like, you know, emotional abuse on a day-to-day basis because it just replicates you know, experiences they had when they were younger, which doesn't help them problem solve better. It helps them go to fight, fight, and freeze mode better. So, so adverse experiences can definitely propel people into greater heights and greater growth. Adverse experiences for some people can actually just be the recurrence of another traumatic experience. And then they seem like they don't have as healthy of coping skills because their brain doesn't. But it's just, and this is the world I was raised in, the addiction world is we're so used to stigmatizing people when we can't fix them. Then they're just there's just something fundamentally wrong about them because of the way we've been going about it is not helping them. Instead of thinking, well, maybe we're the ones who created the cracks in the system or haven't filled the cracks so the people that fall in those cracks are the fault of the system, not the fault of the individuals that fall into it. That, that's where I have evolved so much as a, from a social work perspective. I, I've always believed that, but now I can just look at the the systems and the structures and the policies and the laws and the philosophies behind it. And we are just very Western medical model is very much blame the patient, blame the client mentality. We tell them what to do. And if they're not doing it, that's on them. When the reality is so often, we just don't know how to deal with it. And and our egos don't allow us to do a self-assessment and go, Oh, maybe we're doing more harm than good because maybe we don't know how to treat somebody with this complex of an issue. We can do it and we can do it in a laboratory setting but if they're not going to listen to me, then I don't know how I'm going to help them. That is such an arrogant, self-centered statement that's very common that if, if they're not going to listen to me, if they're not going to do what I tell them to do, then they're not going to get better. And it's like, but do you understand that their brain can't hear you? Yes, this is this is you know? huge. I mean, for, for this podcast, we're going to be wrapping it for our time just to, to keep these bite sized for you. It sounds like we could keep going for quite a bit longer. We're just oh, yeah. t- at the tip of the iceberg metaphorically here for so many different things we could get into. But Casey, I just want to comment as, as I'm wrapping my thoughts and we can, anyone else can jump in here before we fully wrap, but that what you're speaking about is just not as normal 
to take responsibility versus blame outside ourselves, And that's something we talk about in MI quite a bit. And that if I want to be more able to respond, I will take responsibility, which means work for a lot of people. That's what it feels like. And that's what it a lot of times is. It's discomfort. It's more workload. If you want something different, it takes a different input usually to have a different output. And so that's all we're talking about here. If you're in a position listening to this and you're in a position of helping, you're in the position of power. You are getting paid to be ethically influential to these people in front of you. And this is what we're speaking to is that is the work. And the work is taking more responsibility about what's coming out of your mouth to have different kinds of impact. And one way to do that is motivational interviewing that we're speaking to and doing that with a sense of how do I catalyze executive function? How do I honor the struggle? How do I guide the conversation? And how do I acknowledge rules and policies and all that all at the same time while helping transform a life rather than just educate it? And that takes a lot of responsibility is taking that on. So I just want to acknowledge that, but that's where you have the choice to do that or not to transform our society, depending on what your role is, you can do this at a small level, at a large level, organization or individual. We want to say that this is one way to start going about it and hopefully this resonates for you. So that's the last uh, point I wanted to, to say on the big level. I want to see if there's any last points you have. I will say that we can do a whole separate podcast on more specifics, Casey, that have come up for you in trainings like naming the trauma I know is a big thing in trauma-informed versus narrative therapy. You try to stay away from it to not feed it, right? There's all nuances like this when you take MI and put it in the real world. But for now, we're speaking to it at this large level. So hopefully that served you out there. But before we wrap, that's it for me, other than giving you resources at the end. Casey or Tammy, do you have anything else you want to throw in? Yeah. The one thing that I'll add, John, and, and to round out what you're talking about as well is it's where my continued obsession with motivation wing lies. And like when we developed the, the MICA coding tool with just the whole construct of supporting autonomy and activation, I cannot imagine a single person, not a single person choosing to listen to this podcast who is not mm-hmm. trying to do the right things for the right reasons, mm-hmm. not a single person. And, and the first thing that I think of what we measure in motivational interviewing with the MICA is that are we, supporting autonomy and trying to activate the autonomy of this individual. That's, that's our, that's one of my primary intentions in motivational interviewing. And you can see that is the very nature of trauma informed is how do I support this person's autonomy and not only support their right to choose and be who they want to be, but how do I reach inside their belly and activate, activate that desire to be the best version of themselves. And again, I keep thinking anybody that listens to this podcast, I know that that's what they want to do beyond a shadow of a doubt and and to know that there's a method of communication that you can master that embodies that that gives me absolutely so no matter if you are an individual or within an organization just like we're talking about you have the power to create small little changes over time that shape the future and hopefully then through trauma informed especially trauma informed mi practice that that we see the hope for you can learn more about that. We're biased to our resources. So that's what we're going to share here with you listening. There's a lot of people probably out there from Brett Engel and other people that I know that are MI and trauma. And there's certainly things to learn from other MI trainers. I always learn something in that. But for us, we have our own MI trauma informed class in case you lead that. And uh, so if you're interested in this, you can go to ifioc.com and check that out. And uh, if you don't see the sort of uh, time frame or a class you want on there, you can put in a request. We always pay attention to requests. And if you need it for your own private group, because this has inspired you for your small group of friends, organization, whatever, uh, or if you need it on a large level or you're just an individual, we want to cater this to you to be that kind of resource for you. So that's one angle of it is the classes and all that. But then Uh, If you want free resources, you can go to ific.com, take a poke around. You'll see, look around. uh, There's an online membership there. You'll get more information for free through newsletters. There's a blog there, you know, interact with us through that. But you'd probably get more interaction if you uh, submitted us any questions or clarifications at uh, casey at ific.com. 
Uh, as well as we have a Facebook group called Motivational Interviewing Every Day. That's also free and for the public. You're listening to the Communication Solution now. You can subscribe there on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, as well as on YouTube. We have things that we post. So there's a lot of ways to access us or keep us on your radar and follow so that we can help you because that's all we're trying to do. Like 90 whatever percent of our stuff is free that we're doing here so that then we can serve you at another level with higher level membership or higher level training. So hopefully this has inspired you and we're just here to be the communication solution to change your world. And we're wishing you the best and hopefully we've done that today. Thank you so much for your time and wishing you all the best out there in the real world. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Take care. Thank you.